Okay, let's start with the definition of independence. And to be precise, it is uh, stochastic independence. Not linear independence, not some other independence, but stochastic independence. And we will do the definition right now. The symbol for this shorthand notation is uh, this symbol. That uh, looks a bit like um, orthogonality, but it's a stronger form of form of orthogonality <clears throat> and there are reasons of course uh, to this. Um, the story says that uh, this is uh, actually this symbol is Finnish design. This is, uh, I've been told that it's, it was Gustav Elfwing who first uh, introduced this notation and uh, it's, it has be become widely used uh, <clears throat> everywhere nowadays. Although I think it doesn't um, it's not available in standard latte uh, still, but maybe one day. So what does this definition mean? We start to make an, a definition now. We start with um, probability space. So we recall again, omega is a set. F is a sigma algebra on that set. And P is a probability measure on the sigma algebra. And we assume that everything is defined on this probability triple that we look. And we are assuming that um, we are looking at some sigma algebras um, on this omega, some other sigma algebras. So we define we define that um, <clears throat> a collection of sigma algebras. Let's index them by J. And they are now assumed to be sub collections of this F is um, independent if, <clears throat> and what is the condition? The condition is that um, what you might expect, it means that uh, the probability of intersection factorizes. So, what is now the intersection? Um, if J is finite, we know what it is, but in general, we can look at an intersection of sets of the form. We pick some collection, um, finitely many A's, A, J, N, and then we require that this factorizes into probability of A, J, one up to the probability of a j n for all all um, <clears throat> distinct uh, indices so we could take any number of distinct indices in this uh, list uh, or collection j and all all um, sets, so we take a j1 in um, g j1, and so on. So we pick something from each of these uh, sigma algebras that we index uh, with this sense. So this is the definition of independence um, here, or let's maybe highlight it with red, that that's what we defined with this um, text. <clears throat> and as you know, this is quite abstract, but uh, it contains anything in the sense. So especially J can be any index set. We don't care if it's finite or infinite or even uncountably infinite. It can be anything. That's about, that's the first definition of independence. So actually we are going to do three definitions. That's, that's the first one and that actually is the most important one because it contains everything else. The next definition of independence is about random variables. <clears throat> so this was the definition of sigma algebras. 
Now let's look at random variables x, j indexed by this collection j capital. And we define this collection to be independent if, what would you expect now? Well, now we define, we remember that um, what was representing the information content in the random variable. So we might recall that we previously defined sigma of xj, the smallest sigma algebra on omega generated by xj um, to be the information content. And if these are, these are now sigma algebras, so we can define that this random variable collection is independent if these sigma algebras are independent. So this is our definition for random variables. And now we are, have defined what, what does independence mean for random variables. Finally, there's the third definition, which I mentioned. We could look at independence of some events. And again, we take an indexed collection and what would be the definition for events? And you might think that, okay, what if we require this um, factorization for the events, would that be okay for independence? Almost yes, but not precisely so. So we need to require a little bit more actually. The way we, way the proper, the correct way to do this independence is uh, to define that, um, we define that we look at the indicator random variables of these events. And we ask, okay, if these are independent, so then uh, we declare these sets to be independent. <clears throat> and we might recall that these are the indicator random variables. <clears throat> Here. So in this sense, um, we define the last concept using the second, and then we define the second using the first. That's how these uh, definitions are connected. Do you have immediate questions related to this definition of independence? If not, we will look at examples uh, to, yes, please. Uh, I'm just making sure the, so the indicator or the independence of events is done via the indicator random variable so it would be just the same that it would be the sigma algebra generated by the indicator random variables yes let's make actually um, let's make a note about this thanks for this question so let's make a note about this so maybe here <clears throat> let's know let's look at the last um, thing so Let's, uh, yes, what is the, what is the, what is the sigma algebra? Actually now <clears throat> we know that um, for events to be independent, this means actually, if we kind of trace back this, uh, the chain of definition, so the independence here means that the sigma algebras generated by the indicator um, random variables. So this is actually what this um, event independence means. These are the events. So, and actually in this case, when we have an indicate a random variable so we can write down the sigma algebra directly, namely. Um, we might note that um, in the sigma algebra con uh, contained by an indicator, there are not much stuff there. It is a very small sigma algebra. It contains the empty set, of course, because everything contains that. It contains the event itself because that's the pre-image of number one, yeah. it contains the complement of this event because uh, this is the 
pre-image of number zero for the indicator random variable. And in, it contains the full uh, space omega. Let's know that um, if you take, if you look at an indicator random variable, so we know that this is a function from omega to the real line. Yeah. It gives us zero or one regarding if omega is in EJ or if it's not. And that's why the pre-image of number one. So we take the set of real numbers containing just number one. What are the omegas for which this indicator random variable produces one? These are the omegas which are contained in the set. And what is the pre-image of number zero? That's the complement of EJ. So <clears throat> that's why um, this is why the sigma algebra um, can be written down directly in this form. It contains these four events. Okay. <clears throat> so in this sense, uh, now we could write concretely what this means for events to be independent. It means that, um, for example, it means that um, the probability that um, E, um, I and EJ must factorize for all I and J distinct uh, indices in J. But it also means that we need to have um, the probability of E, I complement E, J. This should also factorize. For all in this I, J in uh, this connection, uh, J. <clears throat> And, uh, and so on. So we need to look uh, this uh, factorization for the uh, kind of any finite collection of events, but also we could include, include complements and so on. So in general, we could write that, um, <clears throat> we could write actually that um, <clears throat> this a general collection of events EJ is independent if and only if this type of factorization we look at E J one. Now, if, if you note, actually, I'm using the comma here. Remember, comma means intersection. So I'm using comma uh, to as a shorthand for intersection. And that's what we always do in probability and statistics. So now I'm looking at the connect, uh, composition of events um, E J one up to E J n, or let's actually write down the second member here explicitly, and it was supposed to be second. And we look at this, uh, now it's an intersection of uh, N events. And we know now that um, <clears throat> because these are in the sigma algebras, uh, sigma indicator EJ, so this must factorize according to the formula in this way. But now we know that uh, <clears throat> this type of factorization should, should also work if, uh, if in some places we include complements as well. For example, here, this factorization should be true if we have complement there or we put also complement there, then this factorization should be valid as well. So <clears throat> in a way, we could write as in the lecture note, so how Kalle writes it nicely, we put star here. And we require this to be true for all J1 up to Jn in this collection uh, J and all Ej1. Um, well, no, no, we don't require these to be anywhere. We just um, require that, okay, this is true. And where <clears throat> we say where the, uh, the star, um, belongs to, let's say, like the no symbol or the symbol complement. 
maybe we should in, index these stars, star one, star two, star three. So, oh no, star n. Yeah, you get you get what what I mean. So, so all these star um, i being either the symbol with nothing or the simple symbol about complement. Okay, I hope this is um, <clears throat> clarifying the concept. Um, uh, does the same thing hold uh, for the um, sigma algebra notation uh, for the definition? Um, because uh, if ij uh, belongs to gj, then uh, the complement belongs to? Yes, so the... Uh, Let's so this see. exact same yes. notation could be used um, here above two or... This is a very good point. Um, thanks for asking. So we could look at the general, the most general definition. Let's, uh, let's look at this once more here. And we require that if we pick anything from the sigma algebras, aj1, aj2, ajn, and we look at the intersection, let's put an intersection there as well. It's a bit dirty. So let's actually now just write this comma. So because we are commonly using that one. So <clears throat> now you were asking, okay, could we also put these complements there? And yes, or actually you were pointing out that we should be able to do that. And yes, we can, because if AJ1 is in this sigma algebra, then we know that the complement is there as well. So we can also require this to be true for all these sets and for the complements. On the other hand, this is kind of implied here that, okay, we require it for anything that we pick from the sigma algebra. So in that sense, we are also picking those complements as well. Okay, you might ask, okay, is it sufficient to... Well, maybe I don't answer any more about this question. So if I, if I try to explain more, I may actually confuse more than explain, but hopefully this answers your question, at least partially. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's make one example still about this. So let's make a little note. Note, if um, J happens to be a collection of, um, let's say, assume that J is a collection of two indices and uh, we, we are looking at um, only two events. So we look at, we take two events in the, our sigma algebra F, and then we ask, okay, then actually we can verify that E1, these two events are independent, if and only if their probabilities factorize. sense. And this seems to be a little bit um, um, contradicting what was just said previously. Why is this true? <clears throat> this direction is clear. Yeah. Let me write obvious because it's, it's in, in the definition. What about the other direction? If, um, what if this condition star holds? Um, let's assume that star is correct. Then we could ask, okay, what happens to the, let's say, the joint probability of E1, E2 complement, okay? This should factorize as well because that's what we re just required in the definition. So what happens to the complement? We use the kind of basic rules of probability and we write this as the probability of E1 alone minus the probability E1 and E2. This is what we can uh, do because uh, probabilities are, let's see why, because we can write E1 as the E1 intersection E2 and then we can take the union E1 intersection E2 complement. 
and these are disjoint. This is disjoint union. And then we remember that probabilities are countably additive. So for disjoint unions, we get a sum. So that's why we can use this formula for uh, probability measures. <clears throat> and then we use the property uh, star that we factorize this, um, the second quantity. So we factorize this with P probability of E1 and probability of E2. And then we use the kind of basic arithmetic. We see that this is one minus the probability of E2 in this way. And then we use the, again, a formula that we know that one minus probability is the probability of the complement of E2. So if you look now, what we have there, we have this set uh, the event and, it, and then the complement of E2. And here we have factorized it with, with the complement here. So, <clears throat> For special case, so this is a special case, of course. And then let's say similarly, we can also um, we can also uh, conclude that um, we could take the complement of the first and then the full uh, second set in the full, and then we verify that this is E one complement, this is E two. And then we can also ver verify that uh, the E1 complement, E2 complement is actually then, uh, here we are factorizing, of course. So then here we can factorize the complements of both as well using these uh, rules of probability. So this is exercise 5. Point, uh, something, maybe 5.1 in the lecture note. So if you do this exercise, you know that um, <clears throat> why this, um, this is less obvious, but it's pro possible to verify. So in the special case, when we only have two uh, sets, E1 and E2, so then independence is equivalent to checking this condition in the usual way without worrying about complements. But in the case with more events, let's say three events is enough. So independence of three, we cannot check it anymore in this sense uh, by just looking at pairs so, or, or without looking at the complements. <clears throat> Maybe 